Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Dave Roach, Father McShane, and the distinguished guests. It is such an honor to be here with you at the Breakfast of Champions. Wow. You are an elite group of students at a great university that has allowed you to excel in your academics and athletics. Your parents must be so proud. I know I am. I look out, out at your young, beautiful faces, and it's hard to believe I will be celebrating my 40th Jubilee this year, along with Charlie Elwin. And it goes by like that. And it is this university, Fordham, my uh, loving alma mater, which has shaped my life into what I am today. When asked to be the keynote speaker, I said to myself, what inspiring words can I share with this special group of kids? You are inspiring me. I thought back of my life 40 years later, and I decided to talk to you about my journey. My journey, my athletic journey, my academic journey, and my spiritual journey. My road to Fordham was really a fluke. I, I wasn't supposed to be here. Never in a million years did I think that I would wind up at Fordham University. Let's go back. I'll take you a little back to my history. I grew up in Livingston, New Jersey, which is a suburb of Northern Jersey, and I grew up in a second generation Italian American family. My parents, my sister, and I live with my grandparents. And everything in our house revolved around three things. The love of family, the love of country, and the church. My father, my grandfather was very patriotic. My father was in the uh, Knights of Columbus. My mother was in the Rosary Society. But the most important thing that my family stressed to reach the American dream was to get an education. My parents only had a high school education, and they pushed me and my sister to private school. I went to Mount St. Dominic Academy, an old girl Catholic school, and I saw how hard my mother and father had a sacrifice to pay that tuition. I remember my father even going to work sick at times just to pay that tuition bill. My mother was a disciplinarian in my house, and the words that she would always say to us is don't ever embarrass your father. Well, anyway, growing up beside school, my true passion was sports. I was a real tomboy back then in my neighborhood. I loved playing football during the fall, basketball, baseball with the guys on my block. But remember, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and there were no organized sports for women back then. On Saturday, the boys would dress up in their Little League uniforms and go off to play Little League, and I had to go up in the stands and watch them play. And I would say to myself, I'm better than them. I know I'm better than them. I excelled in sports in high school, especially women's basketball, and I scored my 1,000 points, and I became an all-county in the Catholic School League and I even got noticed by the coach of Seton Hall. And I was offered a spot on their uh, incoming uh, squad in September. My mother was so happy. She was like, oh, I'll give you to stay home. I'll buy you a car. Don't worry, you just go to school. I'll take care of everything. Um, but something very strange happened to me that spring of my senior year that changed my life forever. My English teacher, Mrs. Evans, came up to me in the hallway one day, out of the clear blue, and she said to me, Marianne, my neighbor in Montclair is Pete Carlissimo. He is the athletic director at Fordham University. They're expanding their women's basketball program, and I told him about you and all your accolades that you have, and he would really love to meet you. And by the way, my daughters, my older daughters go to Fordham, they love it, and my younger daughter, Cecilia, is going there next week to visit them. I'll set up a meeting for you to meet Mr. Carlissimo. 
And something, for some odd reason, something down inside me, this little voice said to me, yeah, maybe I'll check it out, what the hell? Yeah, okay. But that was very odd for me because I came from that tight-knit family and I had a very bad separation anxiety when I was growing up. But for some reason, there was this little voice that said, okay, I'm gonna give it a try. And I said, by the way, where is Fordham University? And she said, oh, it's in the Bronx. And I nearly said, oh my God, now I have to tell my mother. She's gonna kill me. Because remember, we're talking about the 70s. New York City is not the way it was today. Um, and for my family, just going to New York was like going to California. So that night, I had to tell my mother that I was selected by my English teacher to represent Mount St. Dominic Academy at a prestigious Catholic school in upstate New York. <laughs> and she said, okay. I remember that day like yesterday. I met Mrs. Evans' daughter, and we drove to New York City together. I remember crossing over the George Washington Bridge, and at that time, the canyons and rows of burnt out buildings down the Cross Bronx Expressway and I'm thinking, gosh, if my mother only knew where I was going. But anyway, we made the turn onto the Bronx River Parkway, made the left onto Southern Boulevard, and then into the parking lot at Fordham. And it was at the end of spring break, and the kids just came back from their spring break, and it was a beautiful spring day. It was a robin's egg blue sky, and I remember walking up Rose Hill, making that turn, looking at Edwards Parade, and that's when I said, this is where I have to be. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I met Mr. Colissimo that day. He introduced me to the new women's basketball coach, Kathy Mussolino, and I was sold. There was this little voice inside me that said, this is where I really have to be. Now I had to go home and convince my mother. Well, anyway, I got home and I told my mother the truth where I was. And my mother never saw me excited. I said, Mom, this is great. It's a great opportunity. They're starting a basketball team in the seven blocks of granite. Vince Lombardi went there. My mother really didn't care. She goes, well, All right, well, you know, maybe uh, this will be a good thing. Do you know you, do you have that separation thing? Mom, I'm, I'm going to do it. And my mother said, OK. She said, By the way, where is Fordham University? When I told her the Bronx, I nearly had to pick her off the floor. Well, anyway, my senior year came and went, and I was the only one in my high school that went to Fordham. And the summer started winding down, and I kept putting off those feelings about leaving home. And that day came soon enough, moving day. And I'll never forget, my mother, my father, and my grandparents, and my sister, we packed his gray Chevy van, and we crossed over the George Washington Bridge down Cross Bronx Expressway, and we were headed toward Rose Hill. And I was assigned my, my dorm room, 212 at Spelman, and we started to unload the car, and little by little, I started to get that separation anxiety feeling, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I looked at my mother, she looked at me, she knew that looked so familiar. And I started to well up, and my mother saw the tears coming, and my mother grabbed me and she said, come on, let's go for a walk. So we took a walk around Edwards Parade, and I didn't care about Edwards Parade at that point, how beautiful it was. I was pleading with my mother, Mom, I made a mistake, this isn't for me, why did you make me come here? She said, you wanted to come. And my mother was really upset, and I just was in a state of, of that anxiety. She said, well, now we have to go tell Daddy. He's unpacking the car. So when we got back to the dorm, I think my father suspected that something was up. And my mother said, my father's name was Pat. Pat, I don't think she's going to be able to do it. And my father looked at me. And he said to me, Mayor, just give it one night. Just give it one night. And if you can't do it, I'll pick you up tomorrow. And there was that little voice inside of me again. That little voice said, agreed. I said, okay. Now, 
that was probably one of the hardest separations that I ever had in my life at that moment. Watching that van go away. Meanwhile, the next day I found out that they made a wrong turn and wound up in Connecticut because they were so nervous. But anyway, that moment in my life changed my life forever. I started my life here at Fordham University. Now, let's get into my first point, my athletics here at Fordham. Soon after orientation, I wound up meeting my teammates. One of them, Ann Gregory, a Bronx girl, she was a freshman, she was recruited. Um, we started to meet each other. And um, you may be familiar with Ann because her jersey hangs in the rafters of, uh, uh, of the Rose Hill Stadium. But anyway, we had our first gatherings together as a team under the new coach, Kathy Masolino, only two years out of college. And she managed to select a squad of girls from the metropolitan area, all diamonds in the rough, and she polished us each and every day to be a cohesive team. We played our guts out for Kathy. We saw her dedication, we practiced hard, but we laughed even harder. And slow and steady, we started to win. But remember, this was back in 1976, when Title IX just started. And the men had everything. We had nothing. We didn't even have our own warm-up suits. We had hand-me-down warm-up suits from the men. And our practices didn't start until after the men finished, which was at 6 o'clock at night. But anyway, we didn't care. We just wanted to play. We played our hearts out. We loved each other. And we started to get our, our roles started to be defined. And we started to win and make our presence known in New York and in the East. It wasn't until my junior year when my team really started to peak and we had a team that was solidifying and we were non-stoppable. We had our point guard, Mary Hayes, another tough girl from the Bronx, Hall of Famer. Ann was our center, All-American, the go-to player on our team, and such an unselfish player. Every time the opposing teams all knew about Ann, they, and they would double team her, she would just dish the ball off to me or my other wing player, Liz McGovern, and we would start shooting, and it just clicked. And that year, we made it to the Sweet 16, and now we had to play the regionals here at Fordham. And we were hosting, and the first team we had to play was Long Beach State, California. And we remember that game, it was a tough game, and it was a fairy tale because we won. And after that game, I'll never forget, I finally felt, knew what it was like to have the press in the locker room. We had TV cameras, we had the press, it was unbelievable. But then the next day, we had to play Pat Summers, <coughs> Lady Balls from Tennessee, with five All-Americans on their team. We knew that it was gonna be a tough game, and in the early part of the game, I'll never forget, Cindy Brogdon, an All-American, did a behind-the-back, no-hand look pass to Holly Warren with an easy layup, and the game was over. <laughs> well, anyway, we were about 25-5 and five that year, and, and Tennessee went on to the Final Four. My senior year was somewhat of anticlimactic, because early in the part of my uh, senior year, uh, in January, we were playing the girls from West Point, and I was supposed to score my 1,000 points that night. And they were always such a physical team to play, and they gave me a really tough time. They weren't finesse, they were more physical. And midway through the game, we were setting up a full court trap, and one girl plowed into my knee, and I fell to the ground, and I felt my knee wobble as I got up, and I knew that was it. But luckily, I did score my 1,000 points before that game was over. And that was... End of my season and the end of my basketball career. But it started my other career, and that's why, as a student athlete, it's so important and how blessed you are that you have the ability to run, to swim. But what happens if you get hurt? You know, by the way, um, did I tell you that, you know, I was, a, I was also a, a biology major. Anybody here science majors? Okay. Not that many. I wonder why. 
But anyway, um, you know, I was the only biology major on my team, and it was very difficult, any science major for that matter, because not only did you have your course load, but you had these labs. And back then, my professors didn't care I was on the women's basketball team. You know, uh, it, we just did, it just didn't matter because they didn't really even know about us. So it was very difficult, but my teammates always did try to help me study. So anyway, um, my career went on, um, and it was not only did I have my academic life that I'm talking about now, but I spent a lot of time in the training room, as I guess a lot of you guys do too, because I, I always was hurt for some reason. I had very bad shin splints. So I spent a lot of time in the training room. And as a result, I got to know the legendary Jimmy Wilson. Jimmy Wilson was the head trainer at the time, and it's not like how it is where everybody has their individual trainers and this and that. Jimmy was the only trainer, and he used to train um, all the sports. But of course, the men always thought the best. But anyway, um, but he offered me a job as a student trainer um, to help him take ankles. Now, I did not have a scholarship when I played at Fordham, so any little money would really have helped me. So I became a student trainer. And I would, t Jimmy taught me how to tape ankles, and Jimmy was like a father figure in the, in the training room. Because, you know, kids had situations, they were homesick like me, and Jimmy had that personality that was so warm and fuzzy, and he was just a great guy, and he embraced everybody, and he taught me how to tape ankles, and he also said, listen, on away games, you tape your girl's ankles, and that's what I did. So I started to hone in my skills, um, being an athletic trainer, and I said to myself, wow, a lot of these injuries that come into the training room are with the foot and ankle. So now my senior year was progressing, and now decisions had to be made. What kind of career was I gonna go into? Um, you know, there was a choice of medical school, but it was very difficult back then to get to an American medical school. So I went to my guidance counselor, and in her office she had a list of all medical fields. Dental, uh, physical therapy, nursing. But something caught my eye, and I saw this book about podiatry, and I took it out. And I started to see what it was. I really didn't even know what a podiatrist was at the time. But they, it was a four-year program. You could become a doctor of podiatric medicine. You could perform surgery. You could work in a hospital. And there was that little voice inside of me that said, you know, this might be really good for you. And then I remember all the injuries that occurred in the training room. So when I went back to discuss it with my family and friends, there were the naysayers. Oh, you're not a real doctor. What do you want to work with feet for? That's, you know, what kind of field is that? But there was that little voice that said, you know, this is really going to be good. So I went back, and who did I discuss it with? But Jimmy Wilson. And I said, Jimmy, you know, I'm thinking about maybe becoming this, you know, foot ankle specialist. What do you think? He goes, Mayor, that's great. You could come back here, and Dr. Zambetti, who was the team doctor at the time, George was somebody who was a role model for me because he played men's basketball. He was our orthopedic doctor. George could do the ankle. I mean, well, he could do the knees and the hips, and you could do the feet. That would be great. I think it's a great idea. And that's when I decided to make my career, and I enlisted at New York College of Podiatric Medicine. But Jimmy left the door wide open for me to come back to Fordham. Now, my academics at uh, New York College of Podiatric Medicine, uh, were very rigorous. But each week I would come back and share my expertise with Jimmy and the team and the players that he had. And Jimmy would have about 15, 20 kids there waiting for me to lend my expertise. I even brought a bunch of my classmates and things started to roll by and those four years just flew by. And I had to go, get my residency at the time. And I remember saying, do I go out of the state or whatever? But I didn't want to be far away from Fordham. 
And at the time I started dating seriously, a classmate of mine, uh, and those were the two reasons why I stayed in New York. But anyway, I started my residency program, and like I said, each time I would come back to Fordham, and life went on. Life went on. I wound up marrying my uh, classmate, my husband Russ, and together we finished our residency. We settled in Atlantic Beach, Long Island. We bought a practice in Long Island, and life started to be okay. You know, we started um, slowly, but little by little, the hospital in nearby caught notice of us, and um, I became chief of the service there. But each week, I would come back to Fordham. Now, the training room back then was like a little gathering place, not only for athletes, but anybody who got hurt, even professors, and even Jesuits. I started to see a lot of Jesuits in the training room. So much so that Father Casey, who was the head administrator at Loyola over here, that was the residence um, for older priests, uh, he asked me, he said, Marianne, there's so many Jesuits that would love their services. Would you like to come and spend a day or once a week and come visit them? And we have a little medical office there. And I was honored. I said, gee, Father Casey, I would love to do that. And that opened up another avenue that I had experienced here at Fordham. And each week, I would visit the priests at Loyola. Many of them were my professors. Father Reed was my Latin teacher, Father Cloney my chemistry, Father Sullivan biology, and Father Grady my theology. And I loved them. They were wonderful, wonderful men and priests. But I started to see them in the twilight of their life. And this brings me on to my third point, my spiritual life here at Fordham. Now, again, I got to see these priests in a completely different light. And they were brilliant men. They would have been captains of industry if they weren't a priest because of their intelligence. And we, I became a, very close with them. And um, I cherished the time being with them to help them. And they needed a little woman's touch sometimes. Every Christmas, I would give them a, a package of socks and underwear and a big bottle of scotch. And they appreciated that. <laughs> but anyway, one Jesuit in particular became a major part of my life. His name was Father William Riley. When I first met Father Riley, he was about 90 years old. And we had a lot in common. He was from New Jersey. And um, he was a philosophy teacher, but he was also had an unbelievable career as a president of Le Lemoyne University, the longest running president at the time. He also was a missionary in Nigeria. He had a very, very interesting life. I used to see Father Riley a lot because he was a diabetic, and diabetics had a lot of problems with their feet. So I would see him often. And one day he came up to me and he said, Mary Ann, how would you like me to be your spiritual advisor? And I said, oh, okay, Father. And, you know, I really didn't know what a spiritual advisor was. I mean, I was a Catholic. I grew up, I thought I, you know, went to church and everything. But it wasn't until Father Riley enlightened me that things changed. Each week, I would visit with Father Riley. And he said, you know, trust your instincts. He taught me about the Jesuit spiritual exercises and finding God in all things, in my family, in my patients, and living an active life in the world by just being an example to others. He told me, say the morning offering in the morning. Offer up your prayers, works, and joys to God. And during the day, if you can, read the gospel and put yourself in the gospel scene whether it be a disciple or even an inanimate object like a tree, to really get the true feeling of what that gospel reading was all about. And then at the end of the day, examine your conscience about what you could have done better or to help look at what you uh, are grateful for. And little by little, just like practicing and shooting for basketball or studying, 
doing this kind of practice started to change my life. I started to see things differently. I started to be more peaceful. I started to accept things more. And when that little voice inside of me used to talk to me, I felt like I had better discernment. You know, Fordham gave me the tools to go through my life's journey and molded my life by being part of a team. A team that taught me trust, humility, unselfishness, discipline, hard work, respect, support, and communication. Qualities I can use in my marriage, in my workplace, and with other relationships. Academically, Fordham prepared me for a medical career, becoming a medical practitioner, uh, being chief of my hospital department, and training 12 surgical residents in the Northwell system, graduating over 50 residents. It has surpassed my wildest dreams. Finally, and most importantly, Fordham nurtured my spiritual life, sustaining me through my life's ups and downs. I'd just like to read this little poem upon closing, written by Shel Silverstein, the author of The Giving Tree. And the name of the poem is called The Voice. There is a voice inside of you that whispers all day long. I feel that this is right for me. I know that this is wrong. No teacher, preacher, parent, friend, or wise man can decide what's right for you. Just listen to the voice that speaks inside. And as Shel Silverstein and I agree, listen to that little voice. What is that little voice? Is it God? Is it intuition? Or is it your destiny? And I want to thank you so much for having me here. I am so in awe of all of you. Thank you.